minutes, so hopefully we can So let's do it. Let's get out of here. Committee will come to order. Today we are marking up several good government bills that will increase the federal government's efficiency and operations. We also will consider legislation to strengthen the United States Secret Service, legislation that supports the District of Columbia, National Guard, and a bill that modernizes the Thrift Savings Plan. Finally, we have several post office naming bills and commemorative resolutions. The com committee's first agenda item today is S-806, the Federal Exec Executive Board Authorization Act of 2009. The Federal Executive Boards, better known as FEBs, serve as forms of federal agencies to communicate and collaborate outside of Washington, D.C. In these and many other areas, FEBs are involved in sharing knowledge and best practices between agencies providing training and communicating hazardous weather conditions. This coordinating role has saved the federal government time and money. For example, FEB-led alternative dispute resolution resulted in an estimated cost avoidance of more than $20 million in 2008. FEBs also help prepare the federal workforce for emergencies. For example, after Hurricane Gustafs and Ike landed in 2008, FEBs provided guidance and assistance to field offices to help them reconvene following the storms. The GAO has stated that FEBs are uniquely positioned to coordinate emergency preparedness efforts. However, the GAO has also found that this current uncertainty regarding FEB funding impacts their ability to provide emergency support services. In light of this, GAO recommended that OPM develop a proposal to address the uncertainty of funding sources for FEBs. The legislation we are considering today, S-806, is based on a legislative proposal submitted by OPM in response to the GAO recommendation. S-806 provides formal statutory authorization for the establishment of FEBs. Importantly, it also provides an interagency funding source for these coordinating bodies. Specifically, legislation directs OPM to determine where to establish FEBs and requires the OPM director to consult with agencies in making these determinations. As a ranking member may be aware, San Diego is an area of the country with a high concentration of federal workers, but no FEB. Under the current system, there is no formal mechanism for recommending that an FEB be established. This legislation would change that. Importantly, S-806 provides for a steady funding stream of FEBs to address the concerns raised by GAO, FEBs in Boston, San Antonio, Portland, and Dallas, Fort Worth, have all expressed concerns about their sources of funding after the current fiscal year. OPM Director John Berry has expressed support for 806, stating that S-806 can only enhance the capabilities of FEBs to contribute to the coordination and operation of federal programs in meaningful ways. I encourage my colleagues to support this good government measure, and I yield time to the ranking member from San Diego, California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, urge support of this bipartisan piece of legislation. Federal executive boards have provided regional coordination for federal agencies since 1961. However, under current law, funding and management of federal executive boards has been inconsistent and the, admi and, and the administration and the efficiency has been doubtful. Many executive boards have a solid reputation for effectiveness, although some have been characterized as wasteful or even useless, a situation made worse by irregular and unpredictable funding. S-806 requires uniform staffing, reporting, and funding for these boards. It strengthens oversight by OPM's Inspector General, and it will enhance regional coordination and management in the federal government. 
Mr. Chairman, this bill, if enacted into law, would be a very first, a good first step. The next step, as always, is for us to continue to look at the effectiveness post-legislation for whether or not we get the kind of effectiveness and uniformity that would be in the best interest of the taxpayers. With that, I support the legislation. Yield back. Thank you, the ranking member. Do any other members seek recognition at this time? If no other members wish to speak, I now call up S-806. S-806, an act to provide for the establishment, administration, and funding of federal executive I ask board. unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection so ordered. Are there any amendments? Hearing no amendments, I move that the bill be reported favorably to the House. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposes? No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and S-806 is ordered reported. We will now consider H.R. 4865, the Federal Employees and Uniform Services Retirement Equity Act. H.R. 4865 was introduced on March the 17, 2010, by Federal Workforce Subcommittee Chairman Lynch and Ranking Member Chaffee. The bill helps federal employees and uh, military personnel by modernizing the Federal Thrift Savings Plan. It allows federal employees as well as members of the armed forces to deposit unused <coughs> annual or vacation leave into their TSP accounts. This change is consistent with the recent change adopted by the IRS for private sector 401k plans ensuring parity between private sector retirement plans and the TSP is good policy. It's good for federal workers and the military and is fully supported by the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board. I thank Chairman Lynch and thank Member Chaffee for their work on this issue and encourage all members to support this bill. I yield now to the ranking member for his opening statement on, on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for my opening statement, I'm, I'm actually going to yield uh, the time to Mr. Chaffetz, uh, the author, one of the authors of the bill. But I do want to share with you that uh, this bill will help by, uniform, uh, by, by providing uniformity within the federal workforce, will help further convince the American people that what we do for ourselves as members of Congress and we do for our staffs as members of Congress we are prepared to do uniformly for the federal workforce. I believe that, if no other reason, would be justification for this, and there are plenty of other good reasons, which Mr. Chaffetz, with your indulgence, will say in, in his opening statement or his support. I yield to Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you. I, I, uh, this is a good piece of legislation. I, I appreciate uh, Chairman Lynch and his work on this. I appreciate uh, this being done in a very bipartisan way. I think this is a good common sense. Uh, I think it will be good. Uh, for the employees uh, throughout. Uh, we want to encourage uh, savings, uh, people planning for their retirements, um, and to be able to use the un to take the unused annual leave and put it into their TSP, I just think is good common sense. I appreciate working on, again, on both sides of the aisle. I appreciate the chairman for uh, bringing this up, and I would encourage all members on both sides of the aisle uh, to get behind this and support it. it it's a good piece of legislation that will help out uh, the federal employees. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. And uh, gentlemen, yield back. Yield back. Any other members seeking recognition? Gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I support the legislation. Congratulate my colleague. I do have an amendment at the desk on behalf of Mr. Lynch and myself. Is the amendment at the desk? It's the Lynch amendment. Hmm? Amendment to H.R. 4865 offered by Mr. Connolly. At the end of Section 2, the following. Add at the end of section two the following D effective date. The amendments made by subsections A and B shall take effect one year after the date. That the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read, of course, and the gentleman uh, from Virginia is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. I I thank the chairman, and as I said, I'm, I'm actually moving this amendment on behalf of myself and Mr. Lynch, 
who could not be here. This is a very simple uh, amendment with respect to the effective date to just make sure that we have adequate time for administrative processing and to make sure the software is in place to be able to implement effectively Mr. Chaffetz's thoughtful bill. Uh, again, it, there's, a, it, there's also allowance here that if they can do it faster than a year, uh, then it can be done that way as well, so long as it's established by the Executive Director of the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board. I just think it's a prudent measure to try to make sure we've got adequate time to make sure the, uh, the machinery is in place to make sure we're doing what, uh, what this bill intends to be done, and uh, I would offer the amendment in that spirit. Right. Any other members seeking recognition to speak on the amendment? Mr. Chairman? Yes, a gentleman from Utah. Uh, thank you. This seems to be a reasonable amendment. It's done in the spirit of making sure that the agencies are able to, to, to uh, uh, implement this in a timely manner, and, and I would look forward and encourage other members to, to support this amendment as offered. Yield back. I thank my colleague. This is an important technical clarification uh, that will assist the TSP Executive Director in implementing these changes. And of course, I thank Mr. Connolly and I thank Mr. Lynch and uh, all that who uh, 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 actually recommended this amendment. And if no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is on adopting the Connolly Lynch Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposers say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any other amendments? Hearing none, I move that the bill HR 4865 as amended be reported favorably to the House. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposes no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And HR 4865 as amended is ordered reported. Our next is, H, is S 1510. Our next order of business. The United States Secret Service Uniform Division Modernization Act. This bill was introduced by Senator Joseph Lieberman. It passed the Senate by unanimous consent. And if anything can pass the Senate by unanimous consent, we should not have any kind of problem with it. Uh, S, 15, <laughs> S 1510 makes a long overdue change by transferring the personnel and pay authorities for the Secret Service's Uniform Division from the District of Columbia Code to the United States Code. The bill creates a new salary table for the Uniform Division and also provides the Secret Service with hiring flexibilities. The legislation deals specifically with the Secret Service's Uniform Division. There are approximately 1,300 Uniform Division law enforcement officers who help protect the President, the White House, foreign dignitaries, and mission offices. The UD helps provide protective arrangements for the President and other foreign dignitaries as venues around the world, such as the security for the President's visit to national parks earlier this month. The measure in S-1510 were endorsed by the Bush and Obama administration as necessary to respond to ongoing concerns about recruitment and retention with the UD. According to the Secret Service, the UD is currently operating on a salary schedule that is out of parity with federal police forces. UD per performs similar protective tasks to other forces, but has the added duties and responsibility of frequently travel in support of services protective missions. In addition, UD has stricter suitability requirements. Every officer must hold a top secret clearance and undergo a polygraph exam. The Secret Service tells us that staffing shortfalls have continued to increase despite new recruitment initiatives. And these shortfalls result in UD's incurring overtime costs that would not be required if UD were at full staffing. I should note, the CBO estimates that this legislation would increase direct spending by $14 million over the next 10 years. Under House rules, this direct spending would have to be offset prior to this legislation moving to the House floor. We will work with the administration to find an offset. 
or will modify the bill so we are able to advance it and strengthen the Secret Service Uniform Division. I urge members to support the legislation uh, and, of course, recognizing that we know in terms of what we have to do before we move it forward. And now I yield five minutes to the ranking member uh, of the committee, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And taking my opening statement in reverse, I would like to thank you for your willingness to, uh, to the agreement that this bill not move to the floor until the $14 million over 10 years has been found in an offset, recognizing that although it passed unanimously out of the Senate, we are now becoming a fiscally responsible uh, uh, part of the Capitol, and I look forward to finding that and working together on a fix. But having said that, Mr. Chairman, I've been an employer, and I also drive past the White House going back and forth to my home, and we're in session every day. I am well aware that in addition to the well-publicized top people who run along the side of the President's motorcade, that a small army of uniform Secret Service personnel represent critical protection here in Washington and when dignitaries, particularly the President and Vice President, travel around the world. The uniform division is the logical place where Secret Service people begin, even if someday they will stand next to the President on a regular basis. Retention continues to be the challenge for this division of the Secret Service. Mr. Chairman, there is no question that any business model that says you will recruit the best and the brightest, you will hold them to the highest standard, and then you will pay them less, <clears throat> encourages us to do the recruiting for other parts of federal, state, and local law enforcement. <coughs> to that extent, it is critical that we find a way to have this organization not have to recruit at great expense a vastly greater number of people only to find their way into other more lucrative parts of law enforcement and federal service. So, Mr. Chairman, I join with you in full support of S-1510, uh, vow to work with you to find the offsets, recommend that we pass this immediately and move it to the floor as soon as we can find those and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlemen from California. Any other members seeking recognition? If no other members are seeking recognition, I now call up S-1510. S-1510, an act transfers statutory entitlements to pay hours of work authorized by the District of Columbia Code for current members of the I United ask States. unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for am amendments at any point without objection, so ordered. I have an amendment at the desk. Amendment to S-1510 offered by Mr. Towns. Amend Section 1 to read as follows. Section 1, short title. This act may be cited as United Without objection, States. the amendment is considered as read, and I yield myself five minutes to explain, and I, don't hope, I hope not to take the entire five minutes. <laughs> My amendment is technical in nature and corrects the existing references in the bill so that they properly reference laws codified in the D.C. official code. It also makes technical clarifications to the provisions regarding current retirees under the D District of Columbia retirement system. The intent and impact of the language on retirees remains the same. I urge members to support these changes and yield to the ranking member for uh, any comments that he might have at this time. Uh, I totally support the manager's technical amendment and yield back. Thank you, gentlemen from California. Do any other members wish to speak on the amendment? If no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is on adopting the town's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposers say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. I understand we have at least one additional amendment. Uh, I yield now to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Crayar. Thank you, Mr. to offer his amendment at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do have an amendment at the desk. The um, members. Kirk designate the amendment. Amendment to S-1510 offered by Mr. Cuellar of Texas. Page 2, after line 18, after Without the Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman from Texas is allotted five minutes to explain his amendment. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, as for the reasons that, that you mentioned, um, 
Secret Service has had trouble trying to recruit and retain the well-qualified personnel. My amendment is just simply a calls for an assessment every three years on the effectiveness of the work to retain, uh, recruit and retain those, uh, those folks. It's a good performance uh, measure, and I, members, I'm asking uh, you all for your support uh, to make sure that we just do the assessment on uh, how well they're doing that work on retaining and recruiting, recruiting and retaining. I'd like to thank the gentleman for his very thoughtful uh, amendment. Any other members wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I recognize the gentleman from California. Uh, if I can enter a colloquy with the gentleman from Texas. Uh, I wonder if, considering that we do not regularly do this kind of an audit specifically on, uh, on the Uniform Division of the Secret Service, if the gentleman might consider modifying his amendment just slightly to say, uh, instead of at least once every three years, to say once within three years, recognizing that we might not want to pass today a law that in perpetuity would have a report coming back that, that might be performed on and be of no future uh, interest to other Congresses. Uh, that would be up to the gentleman, but I would suggest that with the exception of that, it's, it's an, it obviously is a very good amendment. Right. And if that's a, an amendment, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, you know, my, my whole effort is not on the time, but it's more on the assessment, because being on Homeland Security and having worked with the Secret Service and knowing the reasons that were outlined by the chairman, I, th I think, as you also know, Mr. Issa, it's something that we need to do, uh, but I don't have a problem if that's uh, a change that you prefer to have. I, I guess I would ask unanimous consent that the secondary amendment be placed as a technical correct correction by staff uh, between the two members, and we'll vote on the right. amended bill. Without, amended objection, amendment. without objection, so ordered. I thank the gentleman from Texas and, of course, the gentleman from California for that um, uh, actually technical change, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, this further strengthens the bill, as I am, and I'm prepared to support it. If no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is on adopting the Quayle Amendment with the recommendation of the uh, ISA um, amendment. And f if you're in favor, say aye. 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 All opposes? Say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there any other amendments? Hearing none, I move that the bill S-1510, as amended, be reported favorably to the House. The question is on the motion. All those in favor, say aye. Opposers say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And S-1510, as amended, uh, is reported, is ordered reported. The next is H.R. 1722. That's our next order of business. The, the Telework Improvement Act of 2010. H.R. 1722 was introduced by Representative Sarbanes, uh, Representative Davis, and Representative Connolly, Representative Lynch, Representative Wolf, and several other members. It seems hard to imagine now that spring has arrived, but during February, record-breaking snowstorms, the federal government shut down for nearly an entire work week. My staff didn't come to work. Fortunately, the federal government lost productivity. During that period, was significantly reduced because so many employees were unable to come to work. After the storm, OPM Director John Berry reported that the government saved approximately $30 million a day in productivity costs because of the growing number of teleworking employees. H.R. 1722 would help the government to even do even better the legislation builds on the government's current telework capability and will strengthen it by requiring the head of each agency to establish a telework policy. The bill requires the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, to issue government-wide regulations for telework. OPM is also directed to provide agencies with advice, assistance, and any necessary training to managers to make sure telework is utilized to the maximum extent possible without sacrificing agency performance or security. 
H.R. 1722 also requires each agency to designate a telework managing officer to serve as the agency's point person on telework issues, as reported by the Federal Workforce Subcommittee. The bill set stringent reporting requirements to ensure that agencies are complying with the goals of this bill. The legislation also requires agencies to ensure that continuity of operation plans utilize tel telework effectively. I'm pleased to offer my support for this good government bill that will save the taxpayers money while reducing energy consumption, air pollution, and traffic congestions, and will promote work flexibility for federal employees. This is a win, win, win situation. I encourage all members to support this bill, and I yield now to the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I, too, support the bill. <clears throat> but lest it be seen that all telework is good, let us look at some of the other parts that are part of the reason that we would like to have in every agency someone who is focused on the good, the bad, the unnecessary, the profitable, and the costly parts of teleworking. Every member of Congress virtually now carries a BlackBerry. Let us not kid ourselves. It is not just the PC at home in the snowstorm that represents telework. The phone, the BlackBerry, the VPN connection at home, the PC at home, and anything else that allows someone to continue working if they are not at a single conventional location is, in fact, an asset toward that. As many know, every policeman uh, doing highway work in America today is connected. Without that connection, they would pull over a, a speeder and not know the speeder was in a stolen car and perhaps an escaped felon. There is no question that America will not and should not go backwards. But at the same time, there is a potential and some demonstrated bad events that have occurred as a result of telework. Everyone in this room, everyone in America practically, is aware that millions of records, classified or unclassified, have been lost in the name of telework. Pe people decided to take a laptop home with the names and social security numbers of veterans or others, and they were lost. That is unacceptable. So just as I would like to see the work done by the Patent and Trademark Office to allow experts in a field who might otherwise not be willing to work for the Patent and Trademark Office here in Washington, be able to operate from other, some other satellite location and do the same work with the same productivity. That is the goal, one of the goals of telemanaging. As <clears throat> the chairman said, though, we also here in Washington and around the federal government recognize that in the case of a disaster, whether it's one involving FEMA far away or a snowstorm here in Washington, we want the government to continue to operate. So to that end, we will support and continue to try to hold hearings and bring uh, more predictability and efficiency to all telework operations throughout the federal government. As I said earlier, we cannot go back. We must go forward, and we must go forward on a bipartisan basis. With that, I support the bill and yield back. Thank you, gentleman from California. Any other members seeking rec recognition? Mr. Chairman? Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Congressman Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, both you and the ranking member for acting so swiftly in bringing H.R. 1722, the Telework Improvement Act of 2009, before the full committee for markup. Uh, H.R. 1722 was favorably reported out of the subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia on March 24th, and it seeks to improve and expand access to telework among federal employees government-wide. Uh, this bipartisan measure was introduced by Representative John Sarbanes, along with myself, uh, Congressman Frank Wolf, Jerry Conley, who we heard from earlier, uh, Mr. Moran of Virginia, Dutch Ruppersberger and Danny Davis, who also, as the previous chair of the subcommittee that I, I now chair, uh, were very active on this. Uh, despite the fact that the federal government is constantly seeking ways to improve on the way it conducts business, uh, telework continues to be underutilized by federal agencies. This bill provides for improvements that I'm confident will help increase the number of federal employees who take advantage of, of telework and improve the federal government's capacity to develop, to develop and perfect telework-related policies. 
also the systems under telework and security protocols. This bill will also elevate the importance of incorporating telework in agency's continuity of operations planning, as the chairman has pointed out, which I'm sure we all agree would have been extremely helpful this past winter, considering the, the record snow totals and uh, the amount of time that the national capital was affected. Language similar to what is included in H.R. 1722 was passed previously by the full oversight committee and the whole House under suspension during the 110th Congress, and I hope we can have a repeat of that action this year. However, before we do proceed to the floor uh, with the underlying measure, I'd like to ask for the Chairman's consideration in working with myself and my staff and some other interested uh, stakeholders to resolve a couple of outstanding issues on the bill uh, that I think could be handled in a manager's amendment, uh, namely the exclusion of certain legislative branch employees and agencies, as well as some concerns raised regarding the generality of the travel expense test program language, which I believe will include, uh, I think it will be included in the manager's amendment to be considered shortly. Again, I'd like to thank Chairman Towns for his support of this measure, which will help ensure that the federal government remains an efficient, prepared, and environmentally friendly entity. I'd also like to thank the co-sponsors of this, uh, this measure and the members of the committee for their hard work on this issue. I yield back the remainder of my time. Uh, thank you, gentlemen from Massachusetts. Any other members seeking recognition? I ask unanimous consent. Ask unanimous consent now that the bill be considered as read. If no other members wish to speak, I now call up H.R. 1722. H.R. 1722, a bill to improve teleworking and executive agencies by developing a telework program that allows employees. Ask, ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendments at any point with, without objection. So order, ordered, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1722 offered by Mr. Towns. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as original text. I yield myself five minutes, which I do not plan to use at all. My amendment makes a number of small but important changes to the bill, as it was reported by the Federal Workforce Subcommittee. The amendment requires the Office of Management and Budget to develop guidelines on information security protection. It also further clarifies the reporting requirements in the bill by requiring OPM to determine whether agencies comply with the Act and by incorporating information on agency continuity of operations plans into OPM's reporting requirements. The amendment tasks GAO with evaluating the compliance of OPM and agencies. The amendment also gives the General Services Administration the authority to test innovative ways to save the government money through telework travel expense programs. I want to thank the ranking member for working with me uh, on this. And of course, I urge members to support these changes, which will strengthen the implementation of this bill. And therefore, I yield five minutes uh, for comments coming from the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be equally brief. Uh, as you know, we do support uh, the underlying uh, view, and uh, we feel that your substitute amendment validly improves it, uh, and we support it. And I think we'll have—I think we have one. one Jason, you're going to offer the other amendment. Yeah, we will have one small amendment intended to be equally technical. And with that, I yield back. Are there any other? Yes, the gentleman from uh, Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, uh, I support your amendment in the nature of a substitute, and I have an amendment to that amendment at the desk. Amendment offered by Mr. Connolly to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1722. Yeah. I, would ask, I would ask further reading of the amendment be dispensed with. With, without objection, the gentleman is recognized to offer his amendment. I thank the chair. Um, this is a simple, straightforward amendment, and I really pick up on something the ranking member was saying a little bit ago. We need to move beyond the anecdotal to the analytical. 
uh, when it comes to telework. We need to make sure that we've got a database that's accurate and that tells us the good, the bad, and the indifferent, as, as the ranking member said. Um, this amendment is designed to require OPM to do that, to keep, to actually be systematic in making sure that what we think is true and will be true, in fact, can be uh, corroborated with data uh, and analytical studies, uh, not to make them onerous, but to make sure that we're confident that as we move forward in a robust telework program, it's doing and achieving the goals and aims uh, that we want them to achieve. Uh, and that's what this amendment essentially does. It adds a new section to your amendment, Mr. Chairman, uh, in the nature of a substitute requiring that research and periodic reports to us and the public about it. Um, I have shared this language with both the majority and minority staffs and, uh, I, and have incorporated changes suggested by both, and I uh, yield back. Does the ranking member wish to comment on the? Uh... I do. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, briefly, I would like to thank the gentleman from Virginia for giving us a heads up in advance. We were able to, our staff was able to work with his staff on uh, small changes that make it fully acceptable to the minority. Uh, we support this additional technical amendment, and I would yield back. I thank the ranking member. Are there any other amendments? Mr. Chairman? We've got to vote them. Hold yours. Yeah, I thank the gentleman from Virginia for offering this amendment. As we have uh, discussed, the federal government has made great progress in implementing telework, but it certainly can do better. Establishing research goals will assist in this process. This is a good amendment. I urge members to support it. If no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is on adopting the Connolly Amendment. All in favor? Let me know by saying aye. Aye. Opposes? No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there any other? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Gentleman from the clerk, read the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Chaffetz to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to Without HR Without objections, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman from Utah is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, and I appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to offer this amendment. It's a simple uh, minor change that I hope is palatable to both sides of the aisle and all, all of the members. Uh, we certainly have agencies that are rather large and would require a full-time person in order to execute this. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is probably going to need somebody uh, who spends a, a considerable amount of time, maybe full-time, to execute this. But we also have agencies that are rather small. And what we're trying to say with this, this minor amendment here is that it's not going to prohibit them from allowing the roles, duties, and responsibilities to execute this to be incorporated into somebody's existing job portfolio. That may be appropriate, <coughs> pardon me, that may be appropriate for some agencies, not appropriate for others. It just allows them some flexibility within those individual agencies in order to make that self-determination. Uh, the spirit of which I offer this is, is certainly to move this bill forward. I support the bill. I like the bill. I just hope, I think we should allow those agencies a little bit of flexibility to make some self-determination along the way. And with that, I'll yield back the, the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. I thank the chair. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, I want to support this amendment. I think it, it's not only useful, it actually may be necessary. Um, I, I helped uh, start the telework program in uh, lo my local government, Fairfax County where we had 12,000 employees and we did this with somebody who had an other portfolio and we added it to her portfolio and it worked perfectly. So I think clarifying the fact that the intent here isn't that everyone has to hire a new person to be the uh, telework uh, champion, but that in fact somebody could add this to their existing portfolio if that was deemed appropriate and, uh, and workable, uh, is, it makes a lot of sense and I thank Mr. Chavitz for the uh, clarification. And let me indicate that I'm prepared to support this amendment. Uh, if no other members wish to speak on the amendment, Mr. Flake, recognize Mr. Flake from. I'll be, I'll be brief. I just wanted to know if the gentleman from Utah needed any more time, for one. And uh, two, it's a great amendment. Um, as he said, large organizations could likely absorb this into their existing uh, you know, personnel. Uh, they're likely to have a lot of uh, HR people already. Uh, but the smaller organizations uh, may not need to have somebody full-time. So it's a great amendment, and uh, I support it. I, I view it as a clarifying amendment, and I thank the gentleman for raising this concern. 
If no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is on adopting the Chafee Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposers say no. In the opinion of the chair, uh, the, the ayes have it, and the amendment is not no, agreed to. Now to. agreed to. Is agreed to. Is agreed to. <laughs> is agreed to. The question is on the manager's amendment as amended by Conley, Chafee, and amendments. All in favor say aye. Aye. The ayes have it, and the manager's amendment is agreed to. I move that the bill, H.R. 1722, as amended, be reported favorably to the House. The question is on the, the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And H.R. 1722, as amended, is ordered reported. The, the committee now will consider H.R. 3913, the Major General Davis F. Whirley, District of Columbia National Guard Retention and College Access Act. The bill was introduced by Congresswoman Norton. H.R. 3913 was ordered reported by the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, the Postal Service, and the District of Columbia with an amendment. As amended, H.R. 3913 would require the mayor of the District of Columbia to establish a program to provide financial assistance to members of the District of Columbia National Guard to assist in covering higher education expenses. The mayor would establish this program in co coordination with the commander of the District of Columbia's National Guard. Assistance would be capped at $6,000 per year, per year per National Guard member. The bill authorizes such sums as may be necessary to be appropriated to the District of Columbia for the assistance program. H.R. 3913, as amended, would also authorize the transfer of funds from federal agencies for providing assistance under the program. Federal funding for this program is currently provided through the appropriations process, but the program lacks a permanent authorization. The funding level for FY 2010 was $375,000. The district has also provided funding for the program in recent years. H.R. 3913 would permanently authorize the program and name it after the late Major General David F. Hurley, Jr., who served as commander of the District of Columbia National Guard and was killed in the Metro subway tragedy in June 2009. I urge members to support this bill, and I yield now to the ranking member for any comments that he might have. Mr. Chairman, uh, the minority supports this bill, and particularly when we consider that for year after year, effectively, we have abrogated our responsibility to authorize that which appropriators appropriate. It is a good bill. It is, it is, it is a common practice in other National Guards. It is supported by the states with a, a funding uh, source, both federal and state. But it is very clear that for a number of years, we have simply allowed the appropriators to legislate what we have not legislated. So, Mr. Chairman, in addition to the underlying continuation of a good program cooperatively between the federal government with such funds as we may appropriate, and uh, the District of Columbia, I believe we continue this, but we continue this under an authorization that is within the jurisdiction of this committee, and I urge support and yield back. Any other members seek recognition? The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, I'd like to thank uh, the gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Towns, and, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for their swift action on this bill for working with our subcommittee and Congressman Eleanor Holmes Norton in considering this measure. H.R. 3913, the Major General, General, excuse me, the Major General David F. Worley, Jr., District of Columbia National Guard Retention and College Access Act, 
was named in remembrance of General Worley, former commanding general of the D.C. National Guard, who died tragically in the June 22, 2009 Metro Rail collision. And this bill is designed to authorize funding for the District of Columbia National Guard retention and college assistance program, which provides members with an opportunity to receive higher education assistance. The Appropriations Committee has previously allocated funds for the D.C. Guard to pay the cost of the retention and college assistance program, but the program has never been authorized. Because the states surrounding the district already provide education assistance, we risk losing D.C. Guards, which make this bill vital for the retention and recruitment of these men and women. The subcommittee took the measure up during a business meeting on March 24th. It was debated and amended accordingly. The bill was reported out by unanimous consent. I again thank the Chairman for supporting the bill, which honors the men and women who are protecting our nation's capital. Unfortunately, the bill's sponsor, uh, Ms. Norton, is under the weather today, but she, she asked me to convey her uh, sentiment that she is grateful for the swift action that uh, the Chair and the Committee has taken on H.R. 3913. Both Ms. Norton and I look forward to seeing the bill considered on the floor in the coming weeks, and I yield back the balance of our time. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Massachusetts for his comments. Any other member seeking recognition? If no other member wishes to speak, I now call up the substitute amendment to H.R. 3913 adopted by the Federal Workforce Subcommittee. H.R. 3913, a bill to direct the mayor of the District of Columbia to establish a District of Columbia National Guard educational assistance program to encourage the enlistment and retention of persons in the District of Columbia National Guard by providing financial assistance uh, to enable members. Ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendments at any time. I also ask unanimous consent that the substitute amendment to H.R. 3913 adopted by the Federal Workforce Subcommittee be considered as original text for purposes of amendment without objections, so ordered. Are there any amendments to the bill? Hearing none, I move that the bill H.R. 3913 as amended be reported favorably to the House. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposes say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to and H.R. 3913 as amended is ordered reported. The final order of business will be resolutions and postal naming bills. I'm asking consent that we, the, we do this in block and, of course, um, uh, and open to amendment at any time. The clerk will designate the bills. H. Con Res 255, commemorating the 40th anniversary of Earth Day and honors the founder of Earth Day, the late Senator Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin. H. Res 855, expressing support for designation of May 1st as Silver Star Service Banner Day. H. Res 1103, honoring the life and accomplishments of Sam Houston for his historical contributions to the expansion of the United States. H. Res 1189, commending Lance Mackey on winning a fourth, record fourth straight Iditarod Trail sled dog race. H.R. 4861, designating the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 1343 West Irving Park Road in Chicago, Illinois as the Steve Goodman Post Office Building and H.R. 4543, designating the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 4285 Payne Avenue in San Jose, California, as the Anthony J. Cortez Post Office Building. This is amendment at the desk to make technical corrections to H. Conrez 255 and H. Res 1103. I ask unanimous consent that they be adopted and considered as base text without objections, so ordered. Having satisfied the committee's criteria, each of these measures are worthy of support and I therefore urge their adoption. Does the ranking member have any comments on these bills? Mr. Chairman, the minority has uh, reviewed the postal namings and resolutions and we find they meet the requirements of this committee and recommend their approval. Yield back. Do any other members seek recognition at this time? I ask unanimous consent that the measures previously designated and amended be reported favorably by the committee. Without objection, so ordered. This concludes 
Our business for today, I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered, reported, without objection, so ordered. The committee stands adjourned. Okay, now I got good news for you. What's that?